get started, I just want everybody uh, at today's startup, Brian, to say hello to my Snapchat. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, send it out. It's already sent. Well, look, thanks for being here. I uh, appreciate you coming down. I want to start off uh, in a way where we usually start off with our speakers and ask about your childhood. You know, where you grew up, what was your early life like, you know, a bit about your parents. Uh, so, my father was an immigrant from South America, from Peru. Uh, he came to the country when he was 16, uh, following his oldest brother. He was one of nine children, and um, he had a choice. His oldest sister said she was going to go to Australia, and, uh, which is why I've been there. She is there. And, um, and he, his oldest brother said he was going to go to the United States. And uh, he was a restaurateur, so my father came and was a dishwasher for him. <laughs> Ultimately, he uh, got into the union in New York City and uh, was a superintendent for six residential buildings in Queens, where I grew up. And uh, my mother was a Russian and German uh, yeah. Jew from and grew up in Queens her whole life. And uh, and then they had three kids. My oldest brother, Paul, who's a doctor in Manhattan, and my sister, who is uh, in Florida, living uh, near my father now, in Boca. Um, my childhood was somewhat different than most people. Um, Queens was a pretty rough place in the, in the 80s. Uh, we lived on the border of Brooklyn. Um, I was considered a street kid. Uh, always out in the streets, always playing basketball or handball or causing trouble. Um, and uh, but I always had a knack for making uh, for making money, and I always wanted to make money because we didn't have a lot of money. So I always was trying to strive for whether it was better sneakers or just things that other people in the neighborhood had. So um, uh, it was it was definitely interesting to live in, in that neighborhood. Uh, I always wanted to leave. It was something that uh, I strove, I kind of strived for, was to, to move out. When I was 10, 11, 12, I used to always beg my father to let me go move in with my aunts or uncles that were living in Virginia, because it was so different than New York City at the time, and specifically in the borough. Mm. Did you move out? No. No, I didn't move out until I went to college. Uh, so when I was, um, after high school, uh, it was really rough in high school. Our high school had 1,800 students. At the time, there was 3,500 students in the school. So it was really overcrowded. It was really hard to get an education. Um, but I was always, uh, I, I was a gifted kid, so I was put in special schools initially, and then uh, kind of my behavior got me kicked out of those schools. So. <laughs> yeah, well, it was always, it was always, academically, I was, I was great. Behavior though, <laughs> ruined everything. So um, I went to public schools. I went to two different high schools. Uh, one was one was uh, on the beach, which was great, which was great, but it was really bad. It just had a ton of crime and a lot of uh, a lot of issues. So I had to leave after the first year. I went to a second uh, my second high school, um, which was not much better. Uh, again, a public school, really overcrowded. Um, after school, I went to a community college. Uh, which felt like high school, it was just a, a general community college, it wasn't very uh, uh, inspiring by any means. I um, dropped out after my first semester and I went to go work in Manhattan uh, for a gentleman that was running a trucking business in the garment district. Um, after about six months of commuting to Manhattan and then back and forth to Jersey between the two offices, uh, my brother had just gotten back from college. He was in. Uh, he went to the University of Binghamton or Binghamton University in uh, upstate New York, and uh, he said, "Hey, do you want to take a ride to Connecticut?" And I, and I said, "Where the hell is Connecticut?" <laughs> <laughs> I swear. <laughs> and he said, "Well, we're going to go to Bridgeport." He said, "It's about 45 minutes past Grandma's house." Gram my grandmother lived in Whitestone, so right over the Whitestone Bridge. Okay. So I said, "All right, that's not too bad. Whitestone is 15, 20 minutes from us. It depends on the traffic and the bandwidth." And uh, it, so it wouldn't be a bad trip. So we drove up to Bridgeport, Connecticut, where he was going to uh, chiropractic school, or, or at least he was signing up for chiropractic school. And we went into the library, and this was 1990, 1998, 1999. And we were up in the library on the sixth floor, which is where all the register and first hours offices were. And he was doing his thing, signing up for his classes. And I was looking out the window, and I saw the Long Island Sound, and you know, 
I saw trees and all this great stuff. And I lived in buildings. I lived in a concrete jungle, and I was just like, wow, this place is beautiful. I would have watered the bridge for The bridge for it's beautiful. Oh, you there a lot. I had no idea that it was the Wild West back then. <laughs> and uh, I literally walked up to uh, a, to an office in the register, mm -hmm. and I knocked on the, the door. On the knocked on the door, and the guy asked if he could help me. And I said, in my really really thick New York accent. So if you hear any accent right now, I promise you, it is not nearly as bad as it used to be. Uh, and I knocked on the door, and I said in my really th thick New York accent, I said, Yeah, can I go here? <laughs> and he said, um, did you fill out an application? I said, no. And he said, did you take your SAT? And I said, no. And he said, well, how'd you do in high school? I said, I graduated. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, what were your grades like? I said, whatever you needed to graduate. And whatever I did, whatever I said, he invited me in the room. And we sat down and we had a, a conversation just like we're having right here mm. with all these people. <laughs> um, and, and ultimately, he asked me about my experience, and I, you know, I started working when I was 12 years old. Um, mm -hmm. So, well, uh, I worked as a busboy at a, at, a, um, at a pizzeria that was about a block or two from my house. Um, so it was a pizzeria and Italian restaurant. And within the first uh, 60 days, I figured out that if you that the goal of uh, a busboy was to help the wait staff make more money mm -hmm. and to make them more efficient and to give good service. And the goal of the wait staff was to give great service and to get the bill as high as possible so that they got a percentage of that bill. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do that was to get people to buy wine. Mm -hmm. So I was 12, 12 or 13, I might have been 13, I, and I walked up to the table and I guilt tripped some guy into buying wine. I was like, you're gonna buy wine for a beautiful lady? <laughs> and the guy's like, yeah, you know what, give me a bottle of Merlot. And I ran over to the wait, to the, to the waiter, or the waitress, and I said, hey, can you, can, I said, I just sold a bottle of Merlot. And the guy said, what? I said, yeah, what, what do I do? And he said, go get a bottle of Merlot. I said, where, where is it? And he showed me, and, and they walked me over to the table, and, they let, and it was like a cute thing, because I was a kid. Yeah. And they showed me how to uncork it, and they, they trained me right there on the spot. So by the time I was 14, I, I was not a busboy anymore. I was a waiter already. Mm -hmm. And I was making, you know, in four hours, I'd make 50, 60, <coughs> 70 bucks an hour, 50 to 60, 70 dollars, sometimes 100 bucks. And back then, we made, you know, four dollars an hour. That was minimum mm -hmm. wage. So you didn't really get paid. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's sort of where I, I think things really started for me. Um, Anyway, so go back. I'm in. I'm, I tell the, I tell him these kinds of stories, and by the end of the conversation, he said, "You know what? I I'm going to put you. I'm going to let you come to the University of Bridgeport. And I'm going to put you on probation, mm -hmm. even though you you've done nothing that you're supposed to do to get into the school. Because <laughs> <laughs> normally in the senior year, you fill out the application, you do your studying, or maybe even junior year." And, uh, and I did none of that. He said, I'm going to put you on probation for one semester. He said, what do you want your major to be? And I said, well, my, bro my brother's going to be a doctor. I'm gonna, I'll do biology. <laughs> I'll be a doctor, too. Yeah. And uh, that was a terrible decision. <laughs> uh, but when they were signing me up for my classes, they, so he let me in the school. And when they were signing me up for my classes, they asked me if, um, if I wanted an elective. Mm art or music or history or something outside of biology. And by that time, all I wanted to do was get through school to the next level. I just wanted to be in the real world. So I said, and, and unfortunately, I was an artist growing up as a kid. I could draw, I used to oil paint, I was, I did the bass, I did, I, I did all types of things, artistic things. And, um, uh, but my father used to always tell me, my father's really old school, like I said, he's from Peru, so for him, he's like, be a doctor, be a lawyer, there's nothing else. So I, they, I said, no, don't give me any of that shit. I said, give me a business class. And they gave me a business class, and the, it was a marketing class, and 
That semester was terrible. I hated biology. I hated chemistry. I did terrible in those classes. Um, but I maintained the grade that I needed to stay in the class, in, in the school, and I met this professor who changed my life. His name was Professor Shaft. He unfortunately passed away. Um, but he really inspired me, and the next semester I changed my uh, major to uh, business. I focused in marketing, and uh, four years later I got my, uh, my, my bachelor's degree. That's what brought me to Connecticut. Um, in between that, I moved around a lot. I lived in Bridgeport. I lived in... I dropped out of school after the first two semesters. I moved to South Beach for a little bit. Um, I started a business in South Beach for a very short period of time. Uh, we were, I was the first person with my friend, my partner, uh, to bring Italian ices to Florida. Mm. We used to bring them from Brooklyn to uh, Florida and, and on freezer trucks. No one ever thought of that. Everybody always complained about the water in Florida and the fact that the bagels sucked and the ices sucked. So we used to bring, we brought ices down there and we opened up a store and South Beach was just starting to get really hot. So uh, the, the location was really in demand. We sold the lease off. Things weren't working out. Uh, I moved back, finished my degree, um, moved to Milford, uh, ultimately moved to New Haven, uh, and fell in love with the city. So you grew up with this tenacious edge for entrepreneurship and business, and it's been that way since 11 years old. Yeah, I think it was a tenacious edge for opportunity <coughs> so from the wine, so I spotted opportunity, and, and like I was very good at identifying opportunity. Okay. And, uh, and, and I think that um, just my natural intuition gave me an edge. And, uh, but yeah, I would say so. So, so you arrived in New Haven. Let's talk about you know, where you met your co-founder, Peter, um, <coughs> how you started Digital Surgeons. So um, after, after school, I started working at a direct response firm. Uh, they sold uh, like model cars, and they did direct response marketing. It was all through like uh, direct mail and newspaper ads and some TV commercials and stuff like that. And um, I hated that job. I, I, I wasn't really happy with it. So I found a newspaper ad. Right? So I'm like Mr. Digital. Right? I'm a digital surgeon. It was a newspaper ad. And the newspaper ad said, uh, internet sales job, um, $20 an hour plus commission, something like that. And uh, I answered the, the ad and I got an interview and it was for a uh, Yale School of Management student that had started a, an SEO firm mm -hmm. right on uh, Whitney and Trumbull. Uh, and I answered the ad and I go in for the interview and the guy said to me, uh, we manipulate websites so that they rank higher in search engines. This is in 2002. We, we manipulate websites so they, they rank higher in search engines for keywords that people might be searching for. And I just said, holy shit. <laughs> I said, this is going to be the future. I said, this is there's so much money to be made in this. And I said, I, I can definitely do that. And he said, well, you're going to be in sales. You're going to do, do business development for that. Mm -hmm. So um, he offered me some, it wasn't $20 an hour. It was like, it was a complete kind of flip-flop. It was like, well, you make 300 bucks a week, and if you hit these numbers, and these are your escalators, and all this stuff. And I said, I said, listen, I'm going to crush it for you. I want more money. I said, we'll do really well. So I took the job. Um, within a few months, I wound up taking over. It was like, there was about 17 people at the company. Within a few months, I wound up taking this, the second seat in the company wow. next to him, because I was bringing in <clears throat> around 70% of the revenue. And, um, and I really understood the business, and I dove in, and all I wanted to do was learn about the internet and how it worked and, mm -hmm. and, and other angles of the way people were doing business on the internet. And then one day, um, I had another business. You've you got to pick up on the theme here. <laughs> Businesses and making money and things like that. But, um, I, always want, I always loved music, and I, I never wanted to make music. I can't sing. And I really can't play much any of anything, <coughs> but I wanted to, but I wanted to to find an artist and market that person and bring them into the world and, and be behind someone that was a star. Mm -hmm. So I opened the recording studio behind these two engineers that I knew. Make a long story short, I never found anyone that was worth putting my effort and time and money into. <coughs> but my engineer said, "You got to meet this guy. His name is Pete the Geek." <laughs> and he said he does computer things like you, internet things like you. And he didn't really understand what I did, and he didn't understand what Pete did. Um, but I met Pete, and he was a geek, you know, and which is great because I'm I'm a geek. I didn't know I was a geek at the time, but we're you know, and geek is chic anyway, so no one really cares. <laughs> and um, and he was this 
and he was a creative tech. He was a creative tech mm -hmm. before creative techs were sexy, right? C creative techs are more common today, mm -hmm. and they're still, even though they're more common, they're still really hard to find. I'm talking about people that have a creative aesthetic at a, at a level that is higher than your than than your average designer, your average thinker. Um, that was Pete, and at the same time, he was an engineer to the nth degree. He could code, he could hack, he could, he, could, he could do anything. Anything technical, he could do it. And we met and we hit it off and I said to him, listen, we don't do this stuff. We don't do website design and interactive and app development and all this stuff. I said, so, but we talk to thousands of people every week. I have a full sales force, I run the business. I said, I'll pass you the leads and then if, you, if you're getting business, you know, just pass it back. And then the first um, piece of business came in, it was for a clothing designer and the um, and I passed it to, and they needed an interactive website. They were backed by uh, by a pretty big company, and they said they needed all this stuff. And I, I passed them to Pete, and Pete saw them and said, "What am I supposed to do?" I said, "I said do business with them, charge them some money, and do the website, do the do the marketing." And he said, "Well, how much should I charge them?" I said, well, "What do you usually charge people?" And he told me like two thousand dollars. And I said. No, you can't do that. I said, charge him twenty-eight thousand dollars. <laughs> so I said, charge him twenty-eight thousand dollars, and because uh, the, the work, his work was worth it. Like we, I saw what was out there, and he had like it was a, it was a cut above everyone. So he said, I can't do that. So I said, all right, I'll help you out, and I helped him out, and we sold it for twenty-eight thousand dollars, and that was like the light bulb. It was like we can do this, and he delivered it, yeah. and then several months. About a year later, we wound up becoming best of friends, um, and uh, he ultimately, he and I decided that the future of the agency world, uh, the marketing world, was going to be driven by digital, and that the people's digital literacy was going to be a big issue, and because he and I had a leg up on everyone, that we could be successful. And the truth of the matter is, it's still an issue. Digital literacy is still an issue because it evolves so quickly. Mm. Um, but we, in 2006, I left the company that I was at. Uh, we tried to raise money. We actually had someone that wanted to back us. That, um, he passed away. Um, he was a real estate guy in uh, New Haven. And he said he was going to give us, uh, I think it was like $80,000 or a couple, a hundred thousand, I don't even remember anymore. And during negotiations, he actually died. And, and I didn't really care about the money. The guy was just a great guy. Mm. He's really a lot of character. He taught me a lot of things. I used to hang out with him every so often. And he just had a ton of wisdom, and I love that about him. And he passed away, so Peter and I were kind of screwed. Because I was on my own, and I was making good money, but I had left. Mm. And uh, we put $2,500 into a bank account each. Um, and we started Digital Surgeons. And, um, and that was in... 2006, 2007, <clears throat> January, we moved into our space, um, and we've been in business for nine and a half, you know, nine and a half years now. Wow. Well, let's talk about some of the, the things you do today. You know, exactly what does Digital Surgeons do right now, and some of your clients. So we started as <coughs> a website design company that did website design and SEO, and. I believe, we, we have a belief, part of our value, one of our values is that uh, change, is, change is the only constant, and especially in this space, like, it, you have to evolve, if you're not evolving, if you don't evolve, you're di you'll die. So we reinvent ourselves pretty much every 12 to 18 months. So we went from this web design SEO firm to a digital marketing agency, to a digital creative agency, and where we landed today is now, the evolution for us is we're a design and innovation firm, and innovation for us is two types, is product innovation, so we have everything from designers and creatives and, and, and engineers that can build things uh, to um, uh, uh, service designers, uh, so we're really thinking outside the box, mm -hmm. but also innovation for us is about marketing innovation, teaching people that the, the things that they understand today are not going to be tomorrow, that, you know, um, you know, I have clients that tell me that they want to do media plans and they want to do programmatic media and display advertising and all this kind of stuff that happens in the internet. And that stuff is dying very fast. And, but million, billions, literally billions of dollars is getting thrown into it a month. 
and it's just going into the absolute toilet. It is, it is, it is failing very, very quickly. So, so taking businesses, brands, startups, conglomerates, and pulling them across the line and saying, listen, come this way, uh, diversify your media mix, do those things, try new things with uh, digital experiences, with apps, with VR, with augmented reality, um, is how you'll be successful, is how you will evolve. So we say that we evolve businesses. Mm. Um, we work with today uh, everything from uh, startups, typically venture funded, although we do incubate startups in our, in our business, uh, all the way through to Fortune 50s. So we work with um, uh, EMC out of Boston, um, we've done work for GE, uh, we work with uh, Lego, Camelback, the hydration company, uh, uh, a bunch of brands that are in Whole Foods right now, uh, Skillsoft is an e-learning company that we, we just recently um, onboarded and have been working with them as they're going through a trans transition. Um, who else? Gourmet Kicks. Gourmet Kicks. Yeah. <laughs> we've worked with Gourmet Kicks. Uh, the city of New Haven we've helped out. Okay. Um, on the startup side, we've worked with, um, has anybody heard of Arcos Golf yet in Connecticut? Yeah. 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 So, so we named Arcos Golf. We brought them into the marketplace and they were named within the first year, they were named the um, PGA Show Product of the Year. Um, we did their packaging, we got them in the Apple Store, we did all their brand experience, all their assets, um, their video. Uh, we actually invested some money into, the, into their uh, launch. Um, so we're, we're a, a, a very small uh, shareholder, but we're a shareholder in them. So how do you balance out the big players and, and the startups in, in your company? Because I know you're very passionate about the startup side, so how do you balance it? So as the, entrepreneur, as, as the CEO of the company, my role is to, is to sort of run the company from a high level, and then I, I focus on diversifying us and putting us into uh, other categories. So s recently what we realized is that digital surgeons isn't really an agency, right? So we're really, uh, I'm not really a marketing guy anymore. We're not, we do that, we're great at it, we have those assets, but what we wanted to do was, uh, first we tried our hand at product, at our own businesses, our own products, mm -hmm. um, and then, um, and quickly realized that that's a very difficult thing to do, right? Mm -hmm. The hunter that chases two rabbits goes hungry. So I couldn't possibly run two companies two yeah. very different companies that needed very different attention. Mm -hmm. um, but then what we decided to do is look for champions that had ideas uh, or pedigree to run their own businesses mm -hmm. that we could accelerate, that we could light fire to. Uh, and that's sort of my role is looking for that or looking for opportunities <coughs> like in, you know, today one of the things we're talking about is district which is, you know, a real estate opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, which has lots of tentacles, lots of angles. I, I love, when I see opportunity, I love to find, or, or even, I, if, even if I see an idea, it could be a marketing idea, uh, or a product idea for a business that we're working with, I try to find things that have multiple angles, um, so that even if one, one fails, it has so many other pieces of value that you, it, you, it could make money, it could break even, it could have marketing legs and, 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 and have um, some marketing value and return on investment um, that it, it becomes a lot easier to swallow if you consider it a failure. On the topic of failure, what do you, what do you think are some of the common mistakes startups in, you know, come into contact with or that you see? Um, I, so I'd say if I had to say the common mistakes are um, obviously this will be easy, or um, <laughs> it, it happens more, more, than you, that more than you can imagine. You know, people think that they're just going to come up with this idea and they sell it to themselves and they run out and they sell all their friends on it and they sell their family on it. Sometimes they take their family's <coughs> money, right, and, and they put a lot of pressure on themselves and, and they don't know what it's going to take. I often find people that are like, oh yeah, I, I was at a startup. I was at a startup, <laughs> or I had a startup. Um, you know, it takes a, it, it. You need to be really tenacious. Like it's it's incredible. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. As a startup, eight months into our business, digital surgeons. Remember, we started with five thousand dollars. Eight months into our business, we had five employees, and my office manager slash bookkeeper slash accountant slash CFO. 
uh, uh, came up to me, came up to, to me and said, "Hey, um, payrolls in three days, and we have seventy-five dollars left in the bank." And I said, "Where's Pete?" And he goes, "He's been in the bathroom for like thirty minutes." <laughs> and I said, "I said, oh man, now." I, I'm okay with that. I, I understand that the ups and the downs are going to happen. I've, I've been at, at the bottom, and I, you know, and I've, I've felt success. So I, so I ran to the bathroom. I'm banging on the door. I'm like, Pete, what are you doing? He's like, I've been throwing up for 30 minutes. <laughs> He's like, we're going down, Dave. And I said, I said, I said, you, you cannot think like that. You know, you can't allow that to happen. You have to think of yourself. We recently been talking about like businesses as radio stations with signals. Right? If the signal is bad, you get static, you have issues, people can't hear you, the good things don't come back to you, you can't sell your advertising, whatever, however you want to, whatever analogy you want to look at it. He, I told him, I said, I can't fix this issue if you don't have ener the good energy. I really believe that, that, that's, that I would say the second thing is energy is a big deal in, in startups. Um, so, to make a long story short, I'll, I'll just cut that one down real quick. Um, I told him to think positively, things would be okay. Mm -hmm. I told him he had to believe and I mean, it sounds really kind of cheesy. Three hours later, we went to a business meeting and we pitched a, a piece of business for $50,000 and the guy said, can you do any better? And I said, if you write me a check for $35,000 right now, I said, we can close this deal. And he went in his office and he cut me a check for $35,000. <laughs> so, um, so that's two. Uh, the other thing is uh, design. Design is important and, and it's something that startups skimp on constantly um, whether it's the website whether it's the brand um, whether it's the um, the experience uh, and, and experience comes in all forms and fashions it can be your emails it can be packaging it could be your app it can be the software whatever it is mm -hmm. design is so important and you see that is so much more prevalent now look at you know um, Google has a design uh, a design yeah. partner now yeah. John Maida um, uh, Kleiner Perkins has a design a design partner now. It is it is a real thing. People look at look at what you look like and judge you instantly. Instantly. It's just like in the when you were young and or if you're young now or if you're single or whatever in the dating game, you know they say women look at your shoes and it, 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 businesses look at what you look like first. It's the number one thing that happens and and startups tend to skimp there first because maybe they're super technical or they're engineers. You know, at the end of the, I, I just met a startup recently. Came out of Y Combinator. Awesome technology. Looks like shit. They look like shit. And they, and they came to me and they're like, we, we need to button this up because we're not getting any business. The technology is there. But they, have, they can't actually move the needle because no one will talk to them because they can only sell to enterprise businesses. And enterprise businesses are going to say, oh, you don't look like you're, you, you, I should be doing business with you. So those, those are three common mistakes. No, I think oh, one good. last one. It's not easy to raise money. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's move to your next project, uh, District New Haven. I want to talk about what you're developing, where it is, uh, some of the features. So, um, District, so we should be breaking ground in the next two weeks. Um, we've had a lot of movement. Um, we were, um, so uh, just quick timeline. Um, Came up with the idea in December 2014, um, looking at a Google Maps uh, satellite view of New Haven, uh, looking for a, a place to, to call home for digital surgeons. The uh, our building had been purchased several months before, and it didn't and it didn't seem like the uh, new owner had a uh, a direction or a vision for where what he was doing, and he was a, an outsider from New York. Um, and uh, those New Yorkers. Uh, well, I'm a New Yorker too, but I, I think I'm more of a New Havener now. Um, or Connecticut guy. I, I like to think regionally. Um, anyway, the uh, I had the vision of December. I started to do my research and talk to the people that I needed to talk to around the city and the state um, for the property, which is a, a state-owned was it, was a state excuse me was a state-owned asset. Um, then they decided to RFP the project in March. The RFP didn't come out until May 15th. Um, we participated in the RFP, really well designed, really well written uh, proposal. 
uh, watercolor drawings. We really put everything together. We had a, it, it was a complete vision. Um, we also had tenants, right? It's the number the number one thing to have a project is you have to be able to fill it. In order, most people won't finance you unless you fill it. Um, so we had a, a decent amount of people that we were able to talk to and get excited uh, about the project, and uh, we submitted um, on June fifteenth, July twenty seventh. Um, they had the final kind of sit down mm -hmm. with the two competitors. It turned out to be my landlord, um, who was trying to make a, uh, to get that property as a parking lot. Um, and, and then he added a grocery store to it. So his concept was a parking garage and a grocery store um, for the building that he had purchased a year and a half prior. Uh, we had pitched really this idea of a tech and innovation uh, campus. Uh, basically making a West Coast campus on the East Coast for the first, for really the first time in this region, in the Northeast region. Mm -hmm. And um, the city and the state believed in the idea and the people, there was seven people in the committee and they, they voted unanimously for, our, for the idea. Um, my partner in the project is a, a developer, so he's done about $40 million in residential development and, and some commercial development in New Haven, uh, as well as other things. He's also an investor. Um, <coughs> he's invested in quite a few businesses, including CrossFit, which is, uh, is in my building, so that's why we were looking together. Uh, from there, we went through this you know, really, uh, really tough process, um, just because in the private business, in the, in the startup world, you move, you, 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 the speed is just uncanny, the things mm -hmm. that we can do, right? I can stay up till 4 o'clock in the morning every single day. But municipalities get holidays off. And, <laughs> and at 5 o'clock, they, they shut it down. So, um, so it's been, you know, it's been, it was slower than I would like, but from what I understand, it's been faster than anyone's ever seen the municipalities move and the government move before. Um, they, uh, uh, we went through all these different processes, uh, Things that you have to apply for, applications, contracts that are you know two or three inches thick, mm -hmm. um, all of that. Then it has to go through approvals in the city, the board of approvals at the state level. Um, the, the project is a brownfield, so it's it's uh, it's got petroleum underneath the ground from the from the buses that used to be on it. For those of you who don't know, it's a, a form of bus depot where they used to park the buses and fix the buses, mm -hmm. um, and the oils and and and, uh, and the like were hitting the ground. Uh, not purposely, I think, because there's bays there and it's literally a mechanic facility, and they go right through concrete. Concrete is very porous, so it's underneath, but there's a water table because the river is behind the property and the, and the petroleum is kind of just sitting on top of everything. Mm -hmm. So um, we did a, a boatload of environmental testing with an environmental engineering firm um, and uh, about $350,000 worth of testing, almost $400,000 worth of testing on the property to understand exactly what we had. Mm. Uh, it turns out that um, all of the uh, issue is on the, the back side of the building where the mechanics were, and the front side where they parked the trucks has no issue. Um, so we um, priced out what it would take to demo it and all of those things, and the state gave us $5.5 million. That had to go through a process as well, so the bond Bonding Commission has to approve that, uh, which they did. Um, so uh, we just, and then you have to go through your contracts with the state as far as what the grant's going to look like and, and so on and so forth. So we just got that approval for five and a half million. Um, and then you go through your own personal financing and your equity and whatnot. So let's talk about like the ultimate vision of the space and yeah. what you're actually putting there. What will be housed in this campus? So we have, so we're, we're knocking down, there's 195,000 square feet today. We're knocking down uh, 95,000. We're building 5,000 a 5,000 square foot new building that's detached. We're then taking the garage and the front building, which is a two-story building, and we're separating it into office spaces. Um, the largest of the office spaces is 15,000 square feet. Um, office spaces and amenities, I'm sorry. Um, so my, the, digital, the new digital surgeons is 15,000 square feet. Uh, we're bringing CrossFit over, but we're changing it, so it's gonna be the athletic club at district. Um, and they're bringing CrossFit, yoga, spinning, um, and, and just general gym uh, into the property. Um, all the tenants get, um, all the leases come with uh, general memberships uh, to the gym. Um, and then there's showers, locker, uh, there's locker rooms with showers. Uh, the rest of the spaces are broken down. We have a co-work space that we're gonna be building, uh, an incubator space. We have a media space, which is for, so I believe that all brands need to become media. You need to produce content, podcasts, written content, 
um, video content, talking head stuff, whatever it needs to be. So we're building a uh, like a media share room where you you share it, you you pay for a share. Uh, and you get 60 hours for that share to create media and then you can hire an engineer for a lower cost um, and produce media all the time. So that's something that all businesses need to have in the future. So we built that into the space. Then we have, uh, once they, people graduate out of the ecosystem, say the co-working space, which goes from uh, community desk to one seat all the way to six seat suites, um, some of which have windows, they're beautiful. Um, you go into a, a 1,100 square foot spaces, we have several of those. Uh, and then they go up from there. There's a 4,000 square foot courtyard in the middle of the building. Uh, the thought behind that is that today, um, people want flexibility in their real estate, in, in, in their offices. Um, so, you know, in my office now, you can find people working at their desk. You can find them working at someone else's desk. You can find them working um, uh, in the in the in the, the lunch area, the dining area. You can find them in the loft, on a bean bag, on a couch. You name it. They, they they can even go outside. They can sometimes they go uh, to the top of East Rock. Um, I wanted to create that environment, so we put the courtyard in the middle to do that as well for everyone. It's four thousand square feet. It's huge. Um, and then spa other spaces grow from there. Um, ame other amenities we have uh, a kind. So with the river. So what, what part of the inspiration for the project was? Um, has everybody heard, heard about the Mill River Trail? So the there's people in the community that started to, to basically, they, they didn't even ask, they just kind of took machetes and walked the Mill River and started cutting a trail. And put and then right, right here at Maycaven, they started to cut wood signs that said the Mill River Trail and they started hanging it on the trees. And I was seeing it in, on, in social media and Instagram and on mm -hmm. Facebook. And then all of a sudden I saw kayaks in the Mill River and I said, Wow, I, that was just that was, I was like this is a uh, waterfront is key. Mm -hmm. so, so on the property we put a kayak and a paddleboard launch. And we're going to have a house there that's going to be where you can get your, a kayak and a paddleboard. So for lunch uh, in the morning you go for a, a kayak or a paddleboard uh, ride up the Mill River. You can go all the way to the Sound. You can get all the way to the Sound from there. Uh, come back, go to the gym, take a shower, and start your day. Um, so we put that in uh, an amphitheater. Um, oh, cool. Outdoor amphitheater, yeah, um, right on the river. The concept there is um, there's really nowhere to do sh live shows. Um, I did the 4B festival years ago as a test to see what would happen if I if, if we threw a festival. We did it inside of our building. 4,000 people showed up, and um, uh, and that was a, a, a sign that you could do stuff. But unfortunately, you can't serve alcohol on the green and certain issues. Um, so there's no re real way to do it in New Haven. So having that property now on that campus allows us to bring festivals back so we can have shows. But also I wanted to see stuff like this happen outside. Like we could think about this. Yeah, I'm summer. sweating right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little cold right now too, but you know, in, in another month, Startup Grind's on stage outside on an amphitheater, in an amphitheater with you know, 300 seats. Mm -hmm. You know, how big could that be? Or yeah. TED Talk outside. Yeah. You know, just the, the, the visions that I had for this were, were immense. Correct. So the amphitheater is there. Um, the 5,000 square foot building is a bakery, <coughs> uh, a healthy barbecue, um, and a beer garden. So uh, Jason Sobozinski, who's uh, the owner of Caseus, has, if you guys haven't gone to Caseus, I'd recommend it. It's probably one of the best, if not the best, restaurants in New Haven. Uh, he also owns Ordinary, and he has Black Hog Brewery. Mm. By the way, just a shameless, uh, just a plug. It's not shameless because I don't own any part of his company, but he's in the battle of the beer can right now on CNBC, and he's in. It's like a March Madness bracket, and he's head to head for the championship. So oh, wow. if you want to bring that home to Connecticut, which would be a cool thing for one of our breweries, go to that and give him a vote. Uh, he's the. It's the Ginger Ninja. Um, so hold on, I'm sorry. I look right at you. <laughs> She's a red man. <laughs> it just happened. I didn't even realize. <laughs> it's the ginger ninja, though. Um, so, uh, so we put in that. So now you have the ability to eat, but we're also right on State Street, Upper State. So you have, I mean, just amazing. You've got the pantry. You've got. I mean, it is. It is amazing. You can walk to everything. You could go to the tennis courts uh, behind the the new. Um, uh, the new real estate project that's being done, uh, Corsair, there's 240 luxury apartments being built right on the other side of the bridge. Right. Behind that, there's a track, and there's tennis courts. 
Uh, we're integrating the property with the Mill River Trail so you can go for a walk on the trail or a bike ride. <coughs> uh, we're trying to woo over Make Haven. They were supposed to come, they're a little iffy now, but uh, if they don't, I might just build it and put a, a maker uh, space there because I want people to be able to prototype a 3D print right on the property. And then as a result, your tech and your innovation is coming, right? So we're getting calls from all over the state, from companies, of people that are interested. We're turning a lot of people away because everybody wants to be in the property. Lawyers, uh, doctors, the daycares, uh, yeah. everybody wants to be there because they, there's an energy about the project that's happening. Um, Pick and choose. Yeah, uh, free parking. Free parking. <laughs> uh, that was a struggle for me when I moved into New Haven. Well, when I, when I opened my business in New Haven, we didn't have a lot of money. The rent on Grand Avenue, the place that we started in, was a room about half the size, maybe a third of the size of this room, and the guy wanted seven hundred dollars a month. Jeez. So I said, I'll give you a hundred and fifty dollars a month, and I'll pay you the rest at the end of the year. And the reason why I did that is because number one, I didn't have any money. Number two, he had free parking, mm -hmm. and to pay a hundred and fifty dollars a spot, two hundred dollars a spot is difficult, especially as a business, you know, because it could be. If once you get to 10 people, 20 people, mm -hmm. you're talking about a couple thousand dollars for parking, or you have to put that on your employees, mm -hmm. and that could be very difficult for them too. So free parking. Free parking. Um, well, look, I think we'll end it there, and we'll ask a couple of questions of the audience. I'm sure you have lots of questions.